Hello, this is Mayor Matt with another Chats with Mayor Matt. And uh, we're here talking to Bill Cedar, superintendent of Mount Vernon City School District, who is, we're going to be talking about the census and why this is so important to our school district. So um, I think we're just going to go ahead and dive right in here. Uh, Bill, if I may, what, how do you, how does the school district rely on census data here? Well, good morning, Mayor Matt. It's great to be with you. The census uh, is a really important topic for schools, and I know early on in the process, uh, actually it was last uh, winter, I believe, um, we were approached by some of those who are involved in the census and uh, really trying to tie in schools as to how we could not only educate ourselves, uh, our students, but to even take that information home to parents. And um, because we're, we, we're quite frankly really reliant on this census, um, it's important information to get out and to participate in. And I know many of our teachers were doing so many lessons up until when this pandemic hit in March. And um, so it's vitally important. Uh, we get quite a bit of funding from, uh, from federal resources that are allocated down to state level resources that of course uh, trickle right in here to Mount Vernon City Schools. So it's really, really important. Now, some of those programs, we were talking with, uh, uh, earlier we were talking with Carmen Barbuto with the Knox Public Health Partnership. Um, she also leads the community health assessment. I know that um, school lunches particularly are one of those areas. And, and can you talk about some of those those programs that sure. you rely on census data to for funding? For funding. Well, certainly. You know, when you talk about school lunches, right now, uh, Mount Vernon City Schools, based upon the last census, we have about 42% of our students who are receiving either free or reduced lunches. And that only comes about based on census data. I think it's actually about 38% of our students receive free lunches, meaning they're at a certain poverty level, and uh, about another 5% uh, receive reduced lunches. So when you're talking 42%, you know, you're approaching 50% of your student population. So roughly about 1,800 students receive a free or reduced lunch. Um, uh, that's quite uh, beneficial to them and their families yeah. and it only comes about because of that census data well any anytime you well you're you're an administrator I'm an administrator too so anytime you can get those federal dollars back in your in your tax base is always a good thing because you don't have to uh, stretch your own budget so much to, to make up those differences so and uh, I think um, uh, Carmen was talking about, I think, according to the federal government, the, the poverty level per household, I think, is about $25,000 a year in household income, not just a sing single. It's a little bit different, obviously. Uh, but uh, 25000 just doesn't go that far uh, anymore. Yeah, it really right doesn't. Now. It really doesn't. And uh, when you really dig down into some of the other uh, kind of data pieces and you look right here in, in Mount Vernon, mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of families who uh, are paycheck to paycheck and they struggle. And so anytime we can support them, uh, sure. that's a benefit to us. And because of where we're at in the economic standing um, with this free and reduced lunch thing, we we're able to offer free lunches throughout the summer as well. That's true. And yeah, that's right. And we had uh, how many different stations did we have out at uh, what we had at the schools? Um, I think we were going to do the park also. I can't remember if we did the park. Yeah, now traditionally, um, in, a, in let's say a normal year, not a pandemic <laughs> yeah, year, exactly. um, you know, we've had upwards of three summer locations. Usually it's at Hiawatha, it's at Riverside, and, uh, and we've uh, tried a couple other different locations just to invite families in uh, for a, a free lunch. Uh, this past year during the pandemic, we were able to actually provide those free lunches uh, satellite it out of most all of our elementary schools, high school and middle school. So it's been quite a benefit. And uh, I don't know if you just saw the most recent information that came out from uh, uh, the Department of Agriculture, but they extended um, the free and reduced lunch piece. So now all students in Mount Vernon City Schools um, will receive a free lunch. That's all students. Wow. That's not just students who qualify because of the poverty index, but because of the situation we're in and where we fall in line with uh, being part of that summer lunch program, all of our students can receive a free lunch really through December of this year, or as uh, Sonny Purdue likes to say, until the money runs out. Until and the so, money. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. Hopefully for us, you know, that's just quite a benefit to our students. And we actually are just kicking that off this week. 
And uh, so it's a, nice. it's a wonderful benefit for our kids. Nice. Well, it, it, just addressing that, I, I sometimes will hear um, judgments about families. Oh, can't can't they just provide for their own families and there but there are a lot of people who are i guess would be considered i hate i hate the phrase but they're working poor or they're working two jobs and so it's to make ends meet they don't necessarily take the assistance um uh but they're eligible for it if if it's given to them and so that kind of helps families stretch their household dollars as well does it not it really does and uh unfortunately what you're saying is right um, we tend to find that as our students get a little bit older, they get to middle school and high school, uh, you know, parents who still qualify uh, just decide at that point, or maybe with their students' encouragement, not to apply for those resources. And they really should. But I think as they get older, there's a pride factor that sure. comes in there. And, and uh, you know, some of our working poor um, take great, great pride in themselves, and they, they want to stand up and do it on their own. Mm -hmm. And uh, we certainly applaud them for that. But, but the assistance is there. And uh, if we can help, we want to help. Well, and food, I think pretty much in, in, in Mount Vernon, cer certainly in Knox County, but certainly in Mount Vernon, food is like the last thing that, that people really have to worry about here. And that's, of course, there's, there's several different entities that are involved with that, from the Hot Meals Program to Food for the Hungry, the, the, the school lunch program. Um, and, you know, interchurch social services. So, so food is, is like the last thing that people really do have to worry about. And that's, that takes, that takes a, a little bit of stress off. So it's there, it's a safety net. Well, and it really needs to be. And I know even in this uh, unusual time that we're living, we're in a hybrid format right now um, where our students come to school a few days a week and they uh, work mm -hmm. remotely a few days a week. We've even extended our uh, lunch and breakfast program uh, for parents and for students when they're not in school. Mm -hmm. So if they're at home three days a week uh, on Mondays from 10 to 12, uh, we provide them a free breakfast and a free lunch for those three days uh, just so that we can make sure that our kids don't go hungry. Yeah. Well, if they're not hungry, they're able to learn better too, aren't they? You know, one of the things that uh, was really impressed upon us, uh, you know, back in uh, the early part of the year before the pandemic when we were working with the census takers um, was just the undercounted uh, mm -hmm. number of those who are undercounted and making sure we get an accurate count for what's going on right here in Mount Vernon is vitally important. Uh, they say that almost 2% of all students uh, or children from zero to age five, mm -hmm. uh, parents just don't realize they're supposed to count those students. Yep. And it's so, so critically important. Um, another interesting statistic that was brought to our attention is that we now live in a day and age where uh, our 18 to 35-year-olds, a lot of them are living back home with mom and dad. And sometimes they're becoming the undercounted. You know, they're not counted as that household income because they're living with mom and dad. And, and uh, it's really vitally to, important to, uh, to count all of those folks because they really kind of make the big aggregate really an important feature for us uh, when they want to distribute this money. And related to the count, the last uh, feedback that we had from, from our, our local census contact was that Knox County, was just just slightly it was it was hovering around 70 percent reporting uh self-reporting uh, now the field agents are out now but we've got until the 30th of september to to make that happen i think mount vernon was um just slightly over 70 percent so and and that's by the way a, about a percentage point uh better than our 2010 census oh, okay. so we're above where, where we were in, in 2010 but we're still around 70 percent there's a lot of people that haven't been counted there and when you think about all of the money that goes into this for, from the federal government i think the uh, the figure was 675 billion dollars a year in federal funds that's for the next 10 years so that's 6.75 trillion dollars spread out as you said trickled down to the states trickled down to the municipalities and the counties and, and the townships libraries are another thing obviously uh and schools and public health hospitals fire departments all these areas 
uh, are reliant on the census data. And you know, you you think of those numbers, and they're so staggering; they're hard to really fathom in your head. And I those know many that, zeros, <laughs> I don't know what those many zeros look like. <laughs> but uh, when the census folks came around, they really provided activity worksheets for all of our students from grade kindergarten all the way up through twelfth grade. And I remember uh, reading one of the activities for a senior group, just to really understand what the, the census and what this data really meant. And uh, they were asked to, say, to look up how many students uh, do we have nationwide. And the number was staggering. It's like 315 million uh, are, is, our world, is our U.S. population, but 82 million are school-aged. And, I said, and, and the activity went on to say, okay, now break it down. Let's go a little further. How many seniors in high school? And uh, seniors in high school, there were 4.5 million. Well, let's break it down a little bit more. Let's go into Ohio. How many Ohio seniors? 160,000. And then we said, well, how many here in Mount Vernon? And there's 300. And as you kind of matriculate and go all the way down through, mm -hmm. um, then they were given a sum of money. And they said, okay, here's a sum of money. Now we have to figure out how we're going to distribute that money. And that's why this data is important. And you're one of 300 here in Mount Vernon. How are you going to do it? And uh, the activity gives the class $5,000. And they said, do a census of your class, what their needs and interests and all of those kinds of things are. And now you have to decide how you're going to spend that $5,000. That's exactly what the, the, the government does with the census money. It goes from the federal down to the state. The state looks at all of the schools across the state of Ohio. And they say, okay, you're going to get this, you're going to get this. And they're basing it on this information. So we want it to be the most accurate information we can find. And those, yeah, and, and related to that um, in our own Ohio legislature as well, is they create budgets based on this too. So I think they're going to take this, which is going to, to be part of the, the Department of Education in Ohio. And that's, uh, yeah, these, these, these numbers mean something. Um, and I always, what's funny to me is, well, humorous anyway, I, 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 I hear people who distrust the government so much. Why am I giving my information out to the government so much? Um, well, because this is the reason why it's, it's safe, it's easy and important. And, and then I'll, I'll look and they don't trust the government, but they have these lavish social media pages <laughs> with, <laughs> with pictures and, you know, where they grew up and you know, all this other stuff. So I said, okay, come on, we, let's, let's put it to use here. So, Well, and you know, the census data goes even further than just the, the educational funding pieces mm -hmm. for us. I mean, uh, it determines your uh, House of Representatives. Yeah. And so how many folks are actually representing you, whether it be at the federal level or the state level. And so um, th that information, if you want it to really reflect your ideas and your values, um, is really important. So certainly would encourage everyone to really step up and, and to fill that information yeah. out. Well, it's interesting. We'll see what uh, it, the, the, the 2010 census put us just under 17,000 people. I think it was like 16,900 and some uh, odd, odd folks who lived in, uh, in Mount Vernon. And so we'll see what, uh, what this year's statistics bring for us. So uh, it'll, be, it'll be interesting. So hopefully there's still time and people can still self-report at um, 2020census.gov. Uh, you can go online. If you don't want the field officers knocking on your door asking you, uh, make sure that you go to the website and, and uh, complete the census there. So anyway, so how else, uh, what, what else do you have, Bill, in terms of how it relates to uh, what people might not see, not necessarily students, but staffing and operations and, and, and administration? Absolutely. Well, I think you hit it right on the head there. I mean, certainly the funding piece is huge for us. Uh, really, 49% of the funding that we get here in Mount Vernon City Schools comes from our local tax base, but another 49% comes from the state at the state level. And of course, all that money is being uh, triculated down. 2% we get through federal grants. And uh, the census data is so important on those federal grants. I mean, we, we bring in about a million dollars for students with special education funding. Uh, we have almost 20% of our students who are kind of in this demographic that we have to support, um, you know, in various different ways. We get another about a million and a half through what we would call Title I funding. 
Uh, so again, those funds are incredibly important, but you mentioned staffing. So as we begin to look at um, our student population, uh, our demographics of our uh, community, are we an aging community or are we a growing community with younger people moving in? Um, it really helps us to determine staffing needs. Uh, we're starting to see that our classes are shrinking a little bit. Um, it used to be that we would uh, generally be in the you know, low 300s per class that's coming in. Um, probably over the last five years, we've seen our uh, classes shrink a little bit, down about 280 students. And that doesn't seem like a lot, but when you're talking 20 kids per class times, you know, the number of classes that we have, and uh, when you're looking at kind of a per pupil funding kind of a formula, this whole demographic, it makes a big difference. Right now we have about uh, our staff, our teacher to student ratio is about 18 to one. It's kind of right in line with uh, where the state average is. But as our, the number of our students actually decline, then we have to take a real hard look at staffing measures and make sure that we're in line with where we need to be because we have to balance our budgets just like everyone else. Yeah, that's a, it's a tough spot to be in there. Uh, I know, <laughs> I, know. Um, I feel your pain there, not with students, but uh, you know, with, with, uh, with other things here. So I think um, there was uh, one of the things that you had mentioned in terms of um, the, the the staffing levels, and that's not, that's not just necessarily faculty, but that's 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 running the building too. It, it costs. There are real costs with just having just being able to keep the lights on, the doors open. There absolutely are. I mean, we have uh, 22 full time bus drivers running 22 full time routes. Uh, you know, we have to kind of maintain a bus fleet of about 20 26 uh, full time buses. Um, so that's really important for us. Uh, when you operate eight buildings, six elementaries, and two, um, a high school and a middle school and a central office, uh, I mean, those all take resources and financial, uh, certainly, considerations in there. And then, uh, you know, when I talked about our special education population uh, being a little higher than, than certainly what we would like, but we have to serve those students, um, a lot of aides, you know, kind of one-on-one -on -one aides. So we employ almost 500 employees within Mount Vernon City Schools. And so uh, just like probably your budget, a lot of folks' budget, 80% of our budget is personnel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, so It doesn't that's leave a lot, lot to right. cut, you know, unless you're really going to take a hard look um, at, those, uh, at those personnel kind of resources. Right. And I think... If, I wanted to touch a little bit on the other thing that you mentioned with with the students and the shrinking classes. Um, another element that's related to education is the business community. Businesses look, by the way, they look at demographic data from the census when they do their market research, when they want to locate a new office, a, a, a manufacturing plant, um, a, a new restaurant, uh, or expand their services. They're going to look at, and businesses look at, two main things. How good are the schools and is it a safe place to live, work, and play? And that, the, I'm sure you, you hear that all, all the time or, or if, you, if you meet with business, uh, you have a good relationship with the business community. I know that there's a lot of partnerships that, that you're doing that. But can you talk a little bit about how that actually is really um, pri uh, setting us up for a brighter future if we can take every opportunity we can get to invest in our schools to, to make it a better place here. Well, absolutely. And I think you hit it on the head. I know when people uh, are looking for places to move a business or to move a family, they do check out the schools. And uh, we certainly want our schools to be uh, top notch, not only for those reasons, but just for the kids who are quite frankly here. So, you know, that's why sometimes we get so vehemently strong about these measures that measure schools. We want them to be accurate and reflective of the job that we're doing. And, and sometimes when we hear about all of these testing requirements and this, that, and another thing, um, you know, we wanna make sure that, that we put ourselves in the best position to be a highly rated school. And we believe we've got some amazing things going on. Sometimes the bigger the school, the harder it is uh, sometimes the smaller the school, the, the easier it is to kind of bring some of those uh, kind of those factors into play. But 
um, having quality schools is going to attract people. And quite frankly, having quality facilities, we hear that a lot. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so as you look at our high school and our middle school, and, you know, when I bring people to town or they come and, and, uh, and, and want to take a look, you know, it's just natural to gravitate towards, you know, some of your newer shining stars. I mean, Twin Oak uh, Elementary is one that will often yeah. drive by and, and people are like, wow, you know, you really value schools. And uh, then they drive by some of our older buildings and say, wow, you really keep those up nice. And we say, yeah, they're really, really important. Um, we do have some aging facilities. We've got buildings that were built in 1904 out of Wigan Street, and it's a beautiful old building. And we really uh, work hard to try to upkeep and make those so that when people drive by, they're like, wow, they really care about their schools. You know, this most recent partnership we got into with the Gateway Project, um, certainly it's going to have an amazing impact on not only our community but our school age population. But when people want to come and take a look at our community and they want to say, hey, show me what your schools look like, show me what kind of resources our kids will have, you know, we can drive by the Gateway area now and we can show them from Yellow Jacket Drive to the new Energy Field House to our new bus and maintenance garage and, and we can show it to them with pride. And that was a that was a key partnership between the three entities. Obviously, Mount Vernon City School District, the Mount Vernon Nazarene University, and the City of Mount Vernon all came together, which uh, and, and made this. It's just gorgeous. We we're out taking some. Actually, I was out taking some drone footage with uh, with some folks just on Yellow Jacket Drive and seeing Energy Field House, a new bus garage, and it's just really nice out there. To think that that was, I think it's reflective of the community because we look for creative ways to make things happen. And those partnerships are our key, so. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And that's one of the bigger stories that we share every time we get that opportunity is, you know, we don't have all these little individual silos in town. Um, well, in the private business world too, because that was there was a private business uh, that, that helped out a lot on there. Oh, very, very much so. And uh, as a matter of fact, Energy Fieldhouse, which, you know, we're gonna have uh, kind of a ribbon cutting celebration here coming up at the end of the week you know, was all privately financed. I mean, no school taxpayer dollars went into that. But when you can talk in greater respect about just the, the collaborative nature and the shared pieces of that, the city was vital. Uh, Brian Ball was so important in, in those kinds of conversations. And, um, you know, Mount Vernon Nazarene University had some land that, you know, we really wanted to try to share with them. And, you know, they wanted a track stadium, um, that we allow them to use our high school track. Why build two high school or collegiate tracks? Right. Um, why have two football fields? Why have, you know, multiple of these things when we can share these things? Yeah, and that's a key thing. I think when you look at economic development, particularly in economic downturns, those those communities that win really well look for partnerships, look for shared resources as a way to uh, to make things work and. Uh, I would agree. This is one of the more successful things I think. we. I was glad that I was able to be on council when we made that thing happen. So anyway, well, um, the 2020 census is extremely important for us. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to get online and take that, please do. Uh, like I said, $675 billion a year in federal monies will be distributed around the country. And we want to get we want to take every opportunity we can to get some of those federal tax dollars that you are paying, that we are all paying, we want to get them back in our community. So I want to thank Bill Cedar for being here to talk about uh, what the census looks like through uh, the uh, Department of Education and Mount Vernon City Schools. And uh, we will be chatting with Kelly Brenneman coming up soon, who will be talking about the nonprofit status. So until next time, everybody stay safe, stay strong, and stay smart.